welcome to the first episode of the Matt Weiner Show. On today's show, I'll be discussing an action-packed final NBA Finals that was fucking awesome. So big congratulations to the Toronto Raptors, your newest NBA champions. Also, Nation of Canada, Superfan Nav, and most importantly, to Drake for not ruining another championship for a team. Next after that will be the first segment of the show called Dwarf Head of the Week, one of my all-time favorite her- terms to, dis- to talk about when someone's being an idiot, and it'll be assigned to pretty much whoever I think is a dumbass at the time. Awesome. Then we got an awesome interview of South Florida running back Johnny Ford, who had an incredible breakout freshman year when nobody saw it except himself. Really great conversation there. And I'll be ending the show with some Dodgers recap. And last but certainly not least, free to stink team. Now, after one of the most boring Super Bowls ever, I'm really glad the finals did not disappoint. Game one got kind of exciting at the end, came down to five or six in the last quarter, in the last quarter, but you kind of knew that the Raptors had the game. And then uh, games two through four were definitely not ones that will be remembered, but holy shit, games five and six were a sports fan's wet fucking dream. The series felt like when you're watching a baseball game, that is a pitcher's goal, and it's really starting to drag until the eighth. And then your favorite team goes dummy on a rally and scores like six runs to win the game and ends it on like a perfect high note where it's really exciting and all the all the great moments come through. Like game five and six were as good good as any as any late eighth inning rally in a pitcher's duel to win a game. But it was so satisfying having two games in a row coming down to the wire. And it would I think it honestly would have been two such good games. But anyway, we could have possibly gotten one buzzer beater out of it. Because bo- any both of those buzzer buzzer beaters, the team that had the last possession, would have been so dope. Whether it was Kyle Lowry, and we'll talk about how that how his last shot attempt was actually not really his fault and shouldn't be slandered as much. And then Steph hitting a th- that three at the end would have been even more dope. Kind of talking about social media right now and how it's affected the finals. Just mentioned it right there with Kyle Lowry, but social media during the finals is always fun when you get some dank memes or whatnot, solid laughs solid memories that kind of definitely sh- show a great timeline of what's been happening. But God, people are such prisoners to only remembering each game by the last minute. You know, as someone who is currently supporting a luscious dad bod, <clears throat> lay off the Kyle Lowry fat jokes and fuck y'all for hating on my dog. After being torn to shreds, to shreds, for missing a greatly contested and partially tip shot by Draymond, who at least during this finals, was the best defender on the floor. He comes back and has the most dominant performance of Game 6 of any player. I mean, Game 5, he had even he even had the second most points on the Raptors, and people are t- saying that he blew the game. It's just not, it's honestly not fair to him, and it just shows the lack of knowledge that people on Twitter have, because all it takes is people to believe in the meme and then starting to retweet it and spread it around. In that Game 5 as well, he had some huge baskets in the second half that made it possible for them to, to even come down to the last shot like that and be in the position to possibly walk off with a buzzer beater to end the series. Yeah, so especially in a game like that game five where Danny Green does the Ian Frank challenge and hides from all action on the offensive side of the floor when Kawhi gets double teamed, shouldn't that ball be in Danny's hands? After all, the three is literally his whole entire offense. So following those couple days of hate and slander from social media, Lowry acts a damn fool to get game six going. Four for four from beyond the arc, 15 points in the first. He was pretty much allergic to missing. He was definitely the MVP of that game six, like I've already mentioned before. But Kawhi 100% deserved the finals MVP. And who knew that we loved having Kawhi as such a superstar as he's been this past season? He... I mean, this past postseason has been incredible. And yeah, like definitely everybody will remember him by the Game 7 buzzer beater against the Sixers. But let's not forget some of the other things he's done. First, he was completely, completely shutting down Giannis the series, well, this past series in the Eastern Finals. Giannis was running through teams by storm. And he was one, definitely most of, that, most of that Bucks team's offense. And as soon as Kawhi was able to 
help form that great wall to stop Giannis from Euro step zero stepping like a whole court. That was it. That was ball game, and that's when they came back to win four in a row. Mister Clamps against who sh- who I think gonna drop an old take right now is gonna be the MVP of the season. And if he's not, then fuck you, Harden. Truly is as a player was shown so greatly like on the last play when there's point nine left in the game. Uh, Curry just misses it, and then they get the rebound. But since they have no timeouts, they call they call a timeout, which is a technical. Just ask Chris Webber. And the rat so Raptors are inbounding the ball, and the Warriors were playing defense. But if the guy gets it, then he's most likely just gonna dribble it up. Or or I love when finals end with like some guy like chucking the ball to the ceiling and then catching it. Oh yeah, I remember like the 2010 finals when Kobe did that. Yeah, that was pretty sick. But nah, Boardman gets paid. And he got his buckets, buckets, buckets. Coming off that pa- that inbound pass, he laid it up. And on the way to laying up, he actually got fouled. And it was like literally fouling on the buzzer beater. But for whatever reason, they they were so persistent on, on counting it and looking at it over and over to where it kind of sucked all the energy out of the win. But all Kawhi was worried about right there was the three-point play. That's all Kawhi's ever worried about. He's just worried about the play at hand. And it shows you why he's the best, at least right now, he was the best player in the playoffs overall. And that's why he took his team to a fucking finals and won them their first ever. So in that process of winning them their first title ever, congrats to Nick Nurse for completing the hat trick of first-year coaches to win a finals from this past decade. So in his name in the conversation of Steve Kerr and then also Ty Lu. Thank God he's not coaching the Lakers. And congrats, so big, big congrats. Might, might even send them a letter or a really nice email to DeMarcus Cousins for not winning a ring, you bomb. I remember last year going to get fireworks for 4th of July and getting the notification that Boogie signed a one-year deal for $4 million to the Warriors. To the Warriors. After having a lot of talks that he was possibly going to come to the Lakers, so I was already kind of heated about that. We give away Julius Randle, expect or let him go, expecting to get Boogie in. Boogie swerves on us, but no worries, no worries. Sports Karma did its thing, and he was a major factor in why the Warriors lost. To take such a huge salary cut by that amount, I mean, he got paid less than what the Lakers were paying Lou all dang to watch games in the fucking training room. When you're doing something like that, and then it all kind of and Karma catches up, it is a little bit of satisfying. While it is no, while we do have to talk about how he was hurt and not in, so not injured, but hurt. He was playing hurt. The Raptors' first move on offense, game six, when he was on the floor, was just vacuuming him into the high pick and roll to expose how slow he is. I mean, he was playing so slow. Reminded me of myself when I'm playing basketball with my friends, just always being late. I mean, his slowness really caught up to him and almost cost him the game in game five when when on a had a big turnover when he had a offensive when he had an offensive foul for a moving screen where he just couldn't get there fast enough because he's slow and then had had to compensate by throwing his leg out to to Fred Van Bleet. He he definitely was playing like the guy at 24 who was a pretty solid big man in high school. So like he'll have some nice little deflections here and there on defense or dope little finishes at the rim on offense. But at the end of the day, slow feet don't eat. Lastly about the Raptors going to be going over another name that you def I definitely did not <laughs> know of before this playoffs if I'm going to be dead honest Fred Van Bleet was an absolute stud this past playoffs and I don't know it may be a trend for guys in the NBA to start having ki- to start planning out having kids in the playoffs because as soon as his kid was born it was like even more of like a game and, cr- and career changing per- or playoff changing performance than when Clay went into position went into the Pacific Ocean and solved his yips. I mean, Fred, if you take away all those Fred Van Vliet threes, which I know, like, of course, he, he's a player. He's gonna, When he's on the court, he's going to make shots. But he was one of the, he was another big reason that they won the playoffs, and he's kind of like throwback to the Lakers. But definitely saw a lot of Trevor Ariza in him. I mean, he was able to do a pretty solid job guarding Steph in the second half. You know, people expected Steph to completely take take over that game, and he he knew how to stick to him. And what an absolute dog Clay is! 
like Clay Thompson really had a super cool injury moment. No one likes injuries, and I hope he gets better. But whether it is a Kurt Schilling having blood from his ankle seep through his sock, or Kurt Gibson limping after his classic home run in the 88 World Series, or showing the world of how mentally tough athletes are, you know, pe- people don't understand the type of pain that he's going through. And to be able to be, to do just the amount of force that he's able to push while being as injured as he is, is incredible. Like, I, it's one of my biggest pet peeves when people who are average Samaritans complain about athletes and injuries and saying that they're princesses and whatnot. Because if anybody anybody deals with injuries that these guys did, then they, w- they wouldn't shut the fuck up about it. So always give athletes more credit to when they're talking about an injury. Yeah, I mean, watching him come back from the tunnel when he got the news that if he didn't shoot the free throws after that missed dunk, after the missed dunk and the foul and the play that injured him, like he would not be able to return the game and he's walking with Bob Myers. It was awesome. It honestly felt like a movie and it would have been so dope if he came back in, made made the free throws and sat on the bench for the last like 222, then came into the fourth quarter and then uh, helped them win the game. I mean... At the time he left, he already had a 30-burger. So he had a 30-burger, leaving the game with two, with two minutes left in the third quarter. He was, really, he was really smacking this series. I mean, he really was hitting his shit, and it was so much fun to watch these past couple games. But so 100%, people are going to miss the Splash Brothers. You know, there was once a time when these guys were bums and nobody wanted to play with them on 2K. Like 2K12, 2K12, which which I still have, not a team that you would care about. It's like if you played with the, I don't know, it's like you've played, not not with the Suns, but just some average team. If you played with the Kings right now, that's what it would be like. Yeah, so at one point, this was a team that hadn't won a championship and was a team that, that nobody really cared about. And they made, them, they made themselves a dynasty. And you have to call this a dynasty. You can't not call this a dynasty. Will there ever be another team to win three championships in a row? The last team that did it were the Lakers. And the way I, I see the league moving now, you know, it'll be interesting with free agency this offseason, see, seeing who goes where, because obviously you can't, you got you got to wait till, this, this is, sorry, small rant going off topic, but let's shut the fuck up about free agency. Can we please, please stop doing all the dumb rumors and everything? And just wait till something happens and then talk about it. There's not like getting wrapped up in trade rumors is such a is like the NBA's or NBA fans worst like worst habit. And it's so annoying, especially for Lakers fans like last season. I'll admit it was actually kind of cool when we got LeBron. But let's not forget about all the times where we thought we were going to get. Paul, and just I'm just talking about recently. Paul George, Kawhi, um, Jimmy Butler. AD like the eight it's tra- trade rumors trade rumors 100% affected the Lakers and I really think that they should just be left alone and you should just wait till something happens because all you're doing is just wasting your time on something that you have no control over and it's not even like you're just doing it because you're bored just, just just do something else but going back to the Splash Brothers and the dynasty that they really created it I mean I just I just don't see Clay staying there I'll be interested to see how Draymond and Steph do because at the end of the day Draymond was an absolute dog and I'll I'll be talking about him in a little you got to give the Splash Brothers and the Warriors their credit you know they really were unproblematic they didn't do any dumb shit they didn't have any like huge cases that a lot of big athletes pick up and it it was fun watching them they definitely were great examples for the league and were like were cool like Clay is cool Steph's kind of nerdy but Clay's cool and you know what? This is this hot take will be spicy to the max, especially since I'm a Lakers fan. But I think that they are a better d- duo than Kobe and Shaq. Honestly, they definitely work better as a unit and have been and will continue to be great stories for the NBA. So starting to r- wrap finals talk up. Yeah, so huge shout out to Draymond. He meant as much to the team as Curry, and without his defense and cl- and hit those clutch closeouts when they had to go to zone because Boogie was too slow. Huge shout out to Draymond. I mean, he played such a huge role. He's always played the hu- biggest role for the Warriors on defense, and has really been the dog for that team that's helped them get all these championships. But I mean, when you have to go to zone, 
and Draymond's running around like a madman covering all the three-pointers just because Boogie can't move. Like, you could see that he definitely left everything on the court, had a triple-double. He's a sneaky triple-double guy, and, he, you know, he's not – I mean, we, we all know what Draymond's offense is like, and I think if we shoot 100 threes, I'm, I might be close to him. He definitely knows how to run that offense. He's a great passer in that offense, has set up Curry and uh, Clay millions of times. Was kind of a bitch for the last couple of years, but this playoffs definitely made it better. He did all the hard things and 100% – earned his fair share of brownie points because he played hard and he helped that team win literally did one of the most impressive things i have ever witnessed on a basketball court this playoffs and maybe ever so while on defense game four against the blazers one of his contacts fell onto the floor while playing literally literally within less than a second and on the first attempt he found the little transparent fucker finding that contact on the floor on an open nba court Took as much skill as Chris Kyle spotting a terrorist from like a mile away and sniping. Fight a dollar for every time I am late to something and trying to put my contacts in, but the thing falls off my finger and I go into full spaz mode, I'd have more money than the price of a ticket to go to a Lil Xan concert. So Lil Xan is a classic, classic internet dwarf and has been named the first ever dwarf head of the Matt Weiner show. It'll be interesting to look back time to time and see where he's at and see... Who knows, maybe I did the opposite and he, I turned him really smart and now he's going to have a really successful career. Anybody that's listening to this, 100% go to his Instagram and just comment Dwarfhead and just tag me. So that'll, that'll be really helpful. It's good to be aware of your roast. Like this summer, I didn't think my body was too bad, but then at Eddie's house the other day, he just w whipped out a, a wicked muffin top joke to me. And I was like, damn, I realized I, it's time to start hitting the gym, time to start hitting it. Um, hitting the weights and not eating so much so maybe you could do the same thing to Lil Xan, help him out but at the same time low-key fuck Lil Xan. like I wouldn't even take the time to look for two dollars worth of loose change on my car to buy a ticket for this for this crybabies concert and he's just been a complete roller coaster of a career that's been like all over the place and has so much drama for somebody whose music is so ass in my opinion in my opinion, I don't like his music. I, I can think of, I could find something much better to listen to in a second. But I'm glad to see people will pay more for a single backwood than to watch his perf watch him perform his garbage music. The reason why I'm talking about this and why he's been the most, re why he's the dwarf head of the week for now, because recently he was recorded on video by TMZ waving a gun and threatening to shoot someone at a gas station after he got pressed for comments he made about Tupac in, in an interview. No surprise, another mumble rapper that doesn't like Pac. But I mean, in the yelling match with the, with the guy, while he is, has the Glock out and pointed it at a guy on camera, he literally it was it was a bad scene and grew up in SoCal and has ever driven through or lives in Redlands or has spent any time there. He literally looks like every single kid that I played against the Redlands high, high baseball team. It's just a bunch of white kids that it's nowhere near the hood. And he ha he put out a he put out a noisy documentary trying to explain like how bad like the trap houses were and shit. Like nah, you're just kind of a noopid face. Waving a gun on camera is always a neckable offense. And when he's yelling at the person, it's kind of like the same tone that a 13 year old white kid on Xbox Live uses when he gets killed in MW2 and starts hard hardarring everybody and like call and making fun of their mom. Not cool. Both really bad looks. So just keep a lookout for Lil Xan to either release really shitty music, claim victim to something that is his fault, and saying he's done with social media, then coming back a month later. All right, so that was a wrap of that was a recap of the NBA Finals, and the first ever Dwarfhead of the Week segment given to the classic Lil Xan. So now on to an interview with running back Johnny Ford from the University of South Florida. Had an outstanding freshman year where he took full advantage of every opportunity given to him. And now is looking like someone who in a few years could possibly be a Heisman contender. You never know. So I hope you enjoy the conversation. Type of chick that like post half naked clothes and stuff like that just to get likes. Like I hate that. Mm -hmm. So like back back at the back in Miami, that's what you'll see. You'll see females like trying to get a lot of dudes' attention like that, and that's how they get their attention. I don't really 
Mm. Is it just girls just come yeah, just coming down to Miami yeah, Beach just for the pics? I don't really like girls like that that like gotta show their body all to get likes or to get people. Like I hate that. And like in Miami that's the biggest thing right now. Mm. So it's just all the annoying tourists and stuff? Yeah. No, nah, not even tourists, like it's with they they do it with anybody. Mm. Just to get somebody like they just do it. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. I mean, I, I've grown up in kind of the L.A. area, and go down to L.A. somewhat, and I definitely it's the same exact thing. It doesn't change whether you're in Miami, Florida, New York. It's all kind of the same, and yeah, especially like everybody yeah. looking for a way to get money, so they do that because they, they sometimes they feel like okay they'll find somebody with money because people with money are attracted to things like that. Mm-hmm. So like they feel like if they can find somebody with money, that's their way out. Mm. No, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So what is your what's the best way to get your attention then? Me, I got a girlfriend, so like she in school right now. She um I can't really tell you what she's studying cuz like I've been with her 3 years, but like she she goes to FAU, she's studying I really think she's studying criminology right now. So like mm-hmm. I like somebody that that have a future. I don't want to just be the only one with a future. Yeah. And I mean uh, the future for football is looking pretty good right now. Yeah, it's looking, it's looking all right. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's whatever. But, uh, you know, one of my favorite parts about your Instagram, and especially, like, in the football community in general, are the photo shoots at the gas station with, like, the crazy nice cars. You got everybody always brings out their best fits. <laughs> what are your, what are some of your favorite moments? Uh, yeah, nah, them, them definitely my favorite moments. Like, mm-hmm. spending them with my friends, my childhood friends that I grew up with. Them like the, them like moments you can't forget right there. Mm-hmm. So, um, cause I mean the nice cars, the you got the jewelry on, you got the clothes, you're going out, you know, you got the shoes and stuff like that. So, mm-hmm. like when we when we go out together, that's just it's a blessing to go out with all my friends, cause it's some that I even that ain't even make it here. Yeah. So I can go out. As carried the momentum forth, winning your first five. But then losing your last six, what's more contagious, losing or winning? Um, losing. Mhm. You never want to lose. Yeah. Like, just, I hate losing. Mhm. Like, losing hurts. I hate losing. Like, I do anything to win. So, like, losing is like one of my pet peeves too. I hate losing. Mhm. I gotta. Anything I do, anything I put my mind to, if it's competing, anything I gotta win. That's that's just how I feel. Mhm. Yes. Like, I will not take you so what are the? Yeah. I walk into the game. That's mm-hmm. how I play. That's how when I'm facing somebody, I just I cannot let you beat me. So how much of that competitiveness is shown? Um, I guess through. Tr- are you a trash talker at all? Or do you like to, yeah? I do all of that. I, 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 like, I, I try to get you out your game so I can really torture you. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I'm going to talk a lot of trash because I, that's when I, that's like, I'm working while I'm talking trash. So as I'm, like, really killing you, I'm talking trash to get you out your game even more. Mm-hmm. Did you get inspired by any famous football trash talkers in the past, like Richard Sherman or Randy Moss? I'm gonna keep it real with you. I don't even watch like the NFL football and stuff like that. Mhm. I to me, I think it's fake. But that's something I'm trying to get to, so I just gotta, you know, bear with it right now. But I don't really watch it like that. I watch college more than NFL. Mm. So watching kind of college football particular where you're like damn that's where I want to be that's like that's my goal to get to a level like that uh like growing up Frank Gore mm-hmm. like Devin Hester DeAnthony Thomas and Tavon Austin like them really are the only ones I really like really paid attention to mm-hmm. other than I not really pay attention to nobody else yeah cause I I, I want I'm making my own name so I just wanted to get it all done by myself and with the help of my family and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. 
do you have any you mentioned um frank gore who went to the u do you have any chip on your shoulder the fact that the u never offered no nah, i feel like it's right mm. if, if, if god wanted you with that offer he would have gave you six that's mm. how i feel that's how i see it so i ain't worried about it mm. i know if 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 i was still here and we played them i know what i would have did though but Mm-hmm. Other than that, I, it is what it is. I mean, they should have offered me. They could have offered me, but guess they didn't. You know, that, that that's life. Mm-hmm. You never, you never question the God's why. Mm-hmm. So I'm just, I'm blessed to be here though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's too bad that you guys aren't scheduled to play him because that would have been that would have been interesting. I'm sure there's a lot of guys who are in your position that are from Florida, especially Miami, and didn't get the didn't get that chance to play for them or offered. That's, that's why I, my little brother go get it, though. Mm-hmm. The one that I be posting and stuff, he the one that's going to make sure everything, he go get that. Yeah. Um, get the stuff I didn't have. Mm-hmm. But, I, I mean, I, that's kind of one of the most beautiful parts about football and family is that, like, anything that you went – or anything that you went through, you could teach him and show him the ropes yeah. – Yeah, I mean, so I'm just trying to open their eyes to different things, mm-hmm. expand their wings and stuff like that. Yeah, and I'm, you know, it's it, it's great that you're being able to do that and not being selfish and cut kind of cutting the family ties as soon as you get some attention on TV. Yeah, that's that's why I say I'm blessed to be in a position because there's some people in college that ain't even played yet. They can't even talk back to where they from because the kids don't even look up to them because they didn't play yet. Mm-hmm. I played. They saw me on TV. They saw me scoring touchdowns. Like they saw me on ESPN. So I feel like I got a voice. Yeah. And I feel like they're they're listening to me. Yeah. So I'm just blessed to be in the position. My mom always told me like always give back no matter what you do. So I do that without a doubt. Mhm. No, I mean that was showed like perfectly through the through when you were talking to the group of um looks like they were. Uh, I believe it was a youth football team out in South Florida when you were telling them how important it is to get an education and everything watching you were kind of talking about that like some of these guys go back to wherever they're from and they can't show show anything but you're able to show those kids look I'm I was in the same position you were probably possibly in a worse position yet I made it and I'm still here reasons why I love sports the most and especially something like football where you're getting guys from the ghettos of America is that the pressure of making it out the hood is something that literally makes or break or makes careers and makes millions and millions for guys yeah just just because they pass and where they come from and they scared to go back so mm-hmm. like they work they hard mm-hmm. no and you're Hope you enjoyed that interview with Johnny Ford. Great story of how one's circumstances does not define 
does not define them. Where Johnny, whether that was his height being 5'8", you know, a lot of coaches are going to be overlooking him for that. Or hit the circumstances when he of growing up in Miami and all that, where he talked about. I mean, that's insane. Having his dad was shot nine, t- shot nine times. That's crazy. Yeah. So keep a lookout for him next season on the gridiron. Really wish him the best of luck. And who knows? Might be a Heisman contender. Never know. So after every interview, I will be discussing whichever favorite team of mine is currently playing. So right now, the Dodgers will be that team as it is baseball season. So as it starts to head into the fall and the weather gets a little bit chillier, it'll be we'll be talking football. So it'll be football season and I'll be talking about USC, a little bit of Arizona State, Texans and basketball season will be the Los Angeles Lakers. So now I'm going to be touching on my favorite team right now, uh, the Los Angeles Dodgers, recapping a little bit of the last week. So, yeah, so this time for this episode I'll be touching on the Mad Bum Max Muncy situation recapping the last couple of games doing a Mr. Little Joe Kelly rant about Mr. Shit the Bed himself and a little fashion recap from the gala this past week awesome with so many good pics so many good pics and little videos it was dope I wish we could have like one gala week yeah so the Max Muncy cock shot into Covey's Cove was all the run support the Dodgers needed on that Sunday after a great day from Walker Bueller in the bullpen. Now, that one home run lo- also launched Mad Bum into Mad Bitch in a shorter amount of time than the original home run. Look, that was a prime example of a no-doubter and just let Muncie do his thing. A large part of being a pitcher is when you are getting rocked to keep that composure and not worry about what the other team is doing and go back on the bump and hit your spots and do your job. You can't worry about that. You can't worry about what other guys are doing after they fucking rock off of you. But in the single most ironic part that really pisses me off and makes me makes me hate Mad Bum even more. Yes, hate is a strong word, that's why I'm using it. But on April 2nd, he I mean Mad Bum Mad excuse me, Mad Bitch did the same thing when he hit a home run against the Dodgers and stared at it for a while, just like Muncie did to him, and his homer was nowhere near as much of a daddy hack as Max Muncie's. So, like, yeah, b- Mad Bum, you could get the fucking strap. Yeah, so worry about your team getting out of last place first and then what guys do after Mo goes into the Cove. Yeah, so after the Sunday game against the Giants, the boys in blue sadly dropped two in a row to the Angels in the freeway series. And that was a, that was a bit of a tough one to watch. First game, much more than the last. And then had three two-run shots to help get the dub in the Thursday night game, the first of four against the Cubs. So Thursday night was also Joe Kelly bobblehead night, and to no surprise, they filled every trash can in the stadium to the brim, and most f- fans even replied with a nah when they were offered. I mean, he could have been the first Dodger ever to have a bobblehead day canceled like a week before. Uh, they should have canceled it after, the, after that Monday Angels game. That was abysmal. But... That game against the Angels was so hard to watch. It, it, you already know it's gonna be a shit show. First batter in, you just know sometimes. Like four pitch walk, four pitches to start the inning, four walks total, a box pickoff attempt that led to the runner on first advancing, two wild pitches. One of those wild pitches scored a run, and in conclusion, and the Angels were up five three. All of this done. All of this without a single ball leaving the infield. I mean, I'd rather watch those two runs being give up through a walk than a bomb or a hit than a bomb, or even a clutch rally of just of just good base hits being lined together. Because that's good baseball, and that's that's something where like if I'm gonna watch my team lose, I'm gonna at least make sure it's not miserable. Like I said, through a bomb, and if that happens, then so be it. You move on. There's 162 of them, and you you just tip your cap. But that's not how it happened. That was the complete opposite. It just felt like forever. It, I would literally watch grass grow, then watch, then watch that Joe Kelly appearance again. You know, he now he has become a liability for the team whenever he's on the bump. And having a reliever blow up a game is the worst way to lose on the dead homies. It is the worst. After watching a bunch of little, little league games this year from scorekeeping, it was like watching the one kid who... Play strictly right field for a reason, for those 
strictly only two innings that he has to play because his parents signed up for him so he could get a trophy. And when it's finally, but the kid is always, always begging the coach to let him pitch. Just please once, please once. And finally, when it's a, a blowout and the coach is able to put the kid in, and the kid has a performance to the likes of Joe Kelly against the Angels, and the kid has a performance similar to the one of Joe Kelly against the Angels, where not productive, making just stupid, stupid mental mistakes, and just be, it's just hard to watch. Following um, the loss against the Angels, and not to mention, Ryu threw fucking excellent that night, had, I believe, kind of high pitch count, ended with six innings with one earned run, but nonetheless pitched like an absolute dog, Helping his Cy Young case, which he should be winning this year, it would be nice. It would be nice to watch Cody win the MVP and then have Cy have the Cy Young go to Ryu. But yeah, so following that, so following that loss, Tuesday's game was tough to watch as well. But it is something where you can build off of. You know, Maeda gave up two homers and five total runs in the first. But after that, not another single run was given up. Guys okay. like Maeda are so appreciated. And when you're able, especially just kind of games where you go down by a lot uh, early, those last four innings, he, he ended up going a full five. But those last four innings were not pretty, but he got through them, and that's all that matters in the end. Give up another couple runs in the second and just be lazy and call it quits after a while. But he just he stuck in there and was and on a day where he had none of his best stuff. Very few first first pitch strikes, but nonetheless, when you give up five runs in a start, you shouldn't expect your team to win, but it at least still gives your team a chance to win. You know, it's not it's not as soon as you get into like the eight or nine character, uh, as soon as you get into the characters, as soon as you get into eight or nine runs category, that's when it gets kind of a rough night on offense from the Dodgers. Three home runs, however, two came from Muncie, who has been on fire lately. He, I mean, he's been – we talked about him earlier. He can't stop hitting the baseball all around the park. Um, and then also a clutch pinch hit home run from David Freeze. That was as classic as David Freeze as it gets. He wasn't that crazy good the past couple of years for the Dodgers. I think that's might be safe to say. But this season, 100% made a big adjustment. And I think that's the guy who you should be looking at as your everyday first baseman. You know, he's his batting average is above, I believe it's somewhere around 280, 290, 290 and that's a bet you got to have in the lineup. You know, that's somebody who has been getting clutch hits, and wh what would you know, the next day, the Thursday game, he was able to belt out, he was able to belt out a bomb, and it was, it was super, super clutch. The Angels game was kind of tough to watch, but shout out to an actually good reliever, Caleb Ferguson. He put up two great innings of relief and kept that and where he didn't give up a single run and still kept the Dodgers in it. I mean, only, only, only losing by two that game after the way it started out is shocking. And the fact that they were still held to five, that they, went sh they got shut out for the last uh, eight innings is crazy too. Yeah, so Thursday night's game against the Cubs, and he was another guy who had early inning struggles as well. You know, had a bloop single that scored a run. Um, Schwarber teed off on him to start the game. Kind of was another guy like Maeda who at, um, f had most of his struggles in the first inning, but in general didn't had had, but was able to battle back and did have a lot of solid control. Ended up getting seven Ks in about six innings of work, having a quality start, three in runs and six innings pitched, and then bullpen was able to squeak it out. Finally, it was such it was such a fat two nut. home runs. He's definitely like it's safe to say that he's been struggling. You know, the problem is is that he got off to such a hot start that people like me who are dumb and don't f and kind of are just the worst and forget that athletes and especially baseball players like baseball players are never gonna always be hitting well. You know, in a football season, it's very possible a guy like Patrick Mahomes could have sixteen really good games and have his struggles within there but when you're playing a full 162 you're probably going to have 20 30 games where you're going to hit like shit and nobody's going to want to be around you so it was great watching him get his 21st and 22nd home run of the year batting average uh, still is at three is at 356 now i believe he started the game at like low 350s 
But you really got to take a step back and look at what he's done this season. And within, I think, maybe two, three weeks ago, his batting average was at 380, 390. And now it's at like 356. So his batting average has dropped about 35-ish points, give, give or take. And he's still at 356. That's insane. He was able to go through a slump where his batting average drops 35 points. And he's still... You know, not only above 350, but leading the NL in average. That's insane. That's just that just screams MVP. And the way he's been playing, it'll come down to Yelich and Bellinger, because it's always possible that Bellinger could keep on slumping. But what it, it, it'll it'll be interesting, because who knows? Maybe those teams are going to go uh, face each other again. You know, the Bre- Brewers and Dodgers and. Put in that would be awesome to have a series where you have two, uh, where you have the two best guys in the league, in the NL playing against each other. Yeah, so awesome, awesome to see Cody Bellinger do his thing every single week. Is the uh, is the gala that gala was awesome? You know, definitely was able to put guys in a different light and just let them have fun a little and, and bring a date get 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 to show off a baddie. Yeah, so the gala was dope seeing all players and just in a setting where you're most likely not used to seeing them. But Alex Verdugo has honestly turned into one of my fave boys in blues. He just looked so happy and looked like such a bad bitch in those red bottoms. He was definitely bleeding the scene. And the and the outkicked your coverage award goes to Jock Peterson because, wow, you really outkicked your coverage, bud, with the day you brought. Even Craig Sager would have thought your jacket was ugly. But still keep on hitting homers and come on the show to maybe explain yourself in the outfit choice that night. I know that there was a little bit of a Bruno Mars thing going on, but let's leave that to Bruno Mars. And yeah, so last but not least, cannot forget how much of a stunner Ryu was and how he had one of the cutest little poses ever when he was making his way onto the red carpet. Just let out a little peace sign, a little cute smile. Definitely adorable. And yeah, so... That was the first ever Matt Weiner show. I hope you enjoyed it, and I can't wait to build on this. And I'm just really looking forward to being able to spread my sports knowledge and any opinions I have. And this is where all interviews of mine will be posted, at least for now. Who knows? I could change my mind tomorrow. But yeah, just super excited. Don't know. We should probably get an excited count for how many times I said excited. Yeah, so if you have any suggestions for the show as well, just DM me on Instagram at Matt underscore Weiner underscore. So if you're listening to this on YouTube, like, subscribe, and whatever else you're listening to this on, whether it may be a SoundCloud or something else, just keep on following it and stay tuned. Thank you.